Hello, and welcome to Jumpstart. Um, I am so excited. Uh, this morning, we have invited uh, someone that I think you best know as the wife of Dave Cormier. <laughs> um, and the reason you know her that way is because you met Dave a few days ago um, when he was talking about uh, instructional with us and uh, he, he was just wonderful. Um, so if you see the name Dave Cormier on your screen now and someone who does not look like Dave, that is Bonnie, our speaker for today. Um, Bonnie Stewart, I have invited here. Uh, Martha and I have known Bonnie for a long time and uh, she really is the guru of connected learning. And, you know, connected learning has a whole range of definitions, um, some of which are very particular. But with Bonnie, I think you don't need to look those definitions up because for her connection means just what you know in your heart it means. It means being with another person and feeling that, and excuse me, Liz, I'm gonna use the word, that sense of synchronicity with someone. Um, and what's interesting I think about Bonnie is that she is really adept at thinking about synchronicity in online spaces, in asynchronous spaces, um, in places where other people feel like this is just the most alienating thing I've ever experienced. Um, she has had really wonderful success um, at putting what I consider to be like a lot of love and heart into those um, spaces that can feel alien. So she's going to be uh, talking about that stuff with you. And I'll tell you that um, one of the ways that I feel like I got my training wheels in um, doing this kind of faculty development support and thinking about pedagogy was many years ago, I was a um, fellow for digital pedagogy lab and I was assigned Bonnie. She was like, um, I think of it as like, like my mama. Um, and I was her fellow in her class. And basically my job was just to like, you know, support Bonnie and be there. And, um, and that class that I took with her, which was really on all of these kinds of connected pieces, was so uh, transformative of, to how I thought about education in general. We started the semester by doing one of those things that you've probably done in different um, workshops before, where everybody is passing string in between each other to kind of demonstrate all the points of connection between us physically. Um, and that's how I feel every time I work with Bonnie is the strings in my life become very visible. I see those connections that I have with people and I value what they're bringing to my professional work. So I'm super excited to welcome her here. Um, I will tell you that uh, I messed up hard and I um, emailed Bonnie last night and I was like, Bonnie, please tell me that you built in Google because we don't have live captioning yet at Plymouth State, which a lot of places have. And she did not build in Google because why would you? Um, so we're gonna make our way through the captioning as best we can. Bonnie's just gonna go ahead and present and I will use the captioning um, thing to, to put in some notes. But what I'd suggest um, also, and we will not be doing this in the future because uh, I'm, I'm really committed to not relying on the whole any day now Zoom's gonna have captioning, um, we will do better in the future. But for this one, if the captions are really important, you might not wanna rely on me. You might wanna wait until later today um, or tomorrow when we get the recording up where we'll have good captions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bonnie and thank you so much for coming. Robin, I am so delighted to be here. Um, as you can tell, I, I'm, I really enjoy working with Robin. Um, have, am, very, very privileged to have known her for a few years, see a number of other familiar faces out there. And I just wanna say how delighted I am to be with you today. I know that you have, um, at least some of you will have been in some of the sessions earlier this week with lots of really great thinkers. I'm basically kind of probably, hopefully pulling together some threads from that. I don't know um, how much of this will be new necessarily, but at least an opportunity to take up some of these ideas and um, talk about them. I want to say, I'm really sorry about the whole Google Slides thing too, um, because the conversation about community and connection goes far back in my, um, in my career. What I did was I actually went back to 
old PowerPoints before I started using Google Slides and was like, there's a piece and there is a piece and sort of tried to cobble all those together into a new presentation. So we're working with PowerPoint, but the PDF is available for anybody who wants it later. I also wanted to say, um, I did manage to change my name to Bonnie. Uh, rather than Dave, although we do like to mix it up in a variety of ways. Um, but uh, I'm I'm not actually somebody who uses Zoom in my institution. So we teach in Blackboard Collaborate. And I have found that recently I've been doing talks in Zoom. And I am that really awkward person who's there as the so-called like online or tech person who's like, excuse me, where is the button for this? And so one of the things that I normally like to do, particularly in conversations around connection and community, is use live slides and have people right on the screen, but I have had such complete disasters in the past couple of weeks because each different institution's Zoom installation has different permissions. And in one, I kept, every time I got people to write on the screen, when I then went to um, delete that, I couldn't forward my slides anymore. So I have made this a less having you communicate by um, by writing on the screen presentation than I would have preferred, but I am gonna encourage you to use the chat. I would love to have you pop things in. I will try to keep my chat open. I'm just gonna get myself set up now and share my screen. And then um, please do feel encouraged to comment, chat, all of those things um, as things come up for you. And I will get that set. And I just got to open the chat part if I can. Now, of course, I don't know where that is because there we go. Yay. And let's see if I can move it so it's not in the middle of my screen. Oh, there we go. All right, folks. Um, like I said, I am thrilled and delighted to be here today. And I wanna talk about what happens when our nice little schoolhouse and the four walls that we're familiar with suddenly become online platforms. And I've been thinking about this from a variety of perspectives, but one certainly is the idea of once we lose those four walls of the classroom, can we still have community? And no, not in the same sense that we may have been accustomed to, but I believe that really we can, and I believe that it matters and is worth aiming for. I loved what Kathy had said. Um, you called it a moderate success, Kathy. Kathy doesn't know me, but, <laughs> but Kathy, I loved what you said, um, because I think actually if your students come out feeling like they have made meaningful connections with each other, then to me, that is inherently a valuable course because that is one that they will remember and that will stick with them. A few basic premises that I just wanted to put out that undergird my work. Um, again, you feel free to disagree with them in the chat, but I believe that online does not necessarily equal lesser. Although I know for a lot of us, me included, this particular pandemic season has felt constrained and limited and sometimes lesser in some ways. But online itself doesn't have to be that. I also believe that teaching is not just content sharing, and we will circle back around to that. And I believe that learning is social and networked, that we are always learning from someone. It can be an instructor. It can be someone who wrote a book 200 years ago. It can be the person who is sitting in another square of Zoom miles from us. But that the more that we build that sociality into learning, the more that we are fostering really the ways that, that we are meant as humans to, to learn and connect. The reason that I think online learning is possible is because the core infrastructure of the web is based in connection, right? The capacity when I first encountered the internet in the 90s, um, it was kind of the read-only web. And what was happening was certain sites were being built, but through a gatekeeping process that wasn't super different from publishing, right? Um, where places that had money uh, to, to hire webmasters would put up a website of approved content and there it was, and you could go and find it and it was amazing. And then this thing started to happen and in the chat maybe, but how many of you remember the idea of web 2.0? 
when that came out. It was probably about 2004, I think, is, is, is the citation for that. Web 2.0 idea was what you see over here listed as 2006, but it was the idea of the read-write web, right? Or the connection between if I want to make something, I can put it up on the web. I don't need gatekeeping. I can publish it myself. And maybe you see it. And then maybe you connect on to it, right? And maybe you comment on it. And then I see who you are. And I go see what you've put up on the web. And we are not just building a whole bunch of content on the web. We are building connections to the people who are making that content. And that core architecture or infrastructure actually still exists. The capacity is still there. The web has been increasingly monetized and therefore kind of re-grabbed into um, the control of large platforms that are doing some of the same gatekeeping with whole other wonderful uh, data extraction uh, capacities that, um, you know, it's, it's harder and harder to just put out your own stuff and have it seen, but that capacity is still there. And I think it still has power for education. And I want us to think about um, online learning, I guess, through that frame. The web is a tool with which we learn the same as any other tools with which we learn, whether they're chalkboards or books or, or whatever. And it has its own affordances. And those affordances or capacities are still there and still based on the capacity to share and connect and see who has shared other things. But the online community that we're experiencing, and I love Bob here, is not the community that most of us are used to in our classrooms. And I've taught online for close to 20 years. I started actually teaching online um, in a course that was entirely run through email. Um, and still this year teaching, I teach in a Bachelor of Education program. My students take 10 courses at once. It's ridiculous. Um, it's always been ridiculous. There was a plan to have a whole restructuring this year. Thank goodness. That actually got put on hold because of COVID. And in their infinite wisdom, the powers that be decided, well, we can't make too much change at once. So let's just put these students into 10 online courses. Teaching students who are in that many courses at once in an entirely online environment can be really, really draining for everybody involved. And sometimes, because my students are not in the habit of using cameras, etc., I did feel a little bit like Bob staring at my microwave, even though this is supposedly my wheelhouse and the place that I'm comfortable. My key message for this morning is basically community is about presence. And presence is complex and presence is hard, but presence is definitely something that the web can do, albeit a little bit differently from the way that we tend to do it face-to-face. -face. Um, when we teach face-to-face, -face, right, if we were all together, I had the, the pleasure gosh, three years ago now, I think, of uh, being at Keene State. And I know that Karen is here today. And um, so I don't know how many of you are from Keene, but I got to go and stand in a room and meet people and be in physical presence with folks from your institutional system. And when you meet people at a, at a, at a gathering like that, right? you want to build some kind of connection. So if you find a person who seems interesting to talk to, maybe you, you look at them and you pick up some little signal that they're giving and you say, oh, I love your shoes. They may be great shoes. You may just want something to say to that person. You may be like, hey, the donuts are good today. We don't actually make human connections or the next level community usually based on actually super, super deep conversations at first contact. It's just sort of the being near other people and having some small way to build familiarity and start that conversation. And the thing that makes online challenging is that the modes by which we can do those first human touches of Hey, nice shoes. I haven't worn shoes basically professionally. I've not done a presentation in shoes since March, right? So that whole piece has washed away. I have 
exactly. I'm wearing the cutest little slippers, but if I try to get my feet up in the screen, then um, you'll all be needing to call 911 on me and the whole thing will be over. So we won't do that. Um, but some of the, the habits that I've built that are about building connection and building community on that have had to be adapted. I was in the chat and then I didn't go forward. For me, the concept of presence, and I think that my partner Dave may have talked about this back on Monday, at least briefly. Garrison, Anderson, and Archer, way back in 2001, they come out of Athabasca University, which is Canada's online university, um, original online university. It's like the open university in the UK. And they're researchers there, so they have been looking at online learning for a long time. And what they were interested in was what are the core factors of the educational experience for a learner? And obviously there is the cognitive presence, right? And that presence is just what you're teaching or what you think you're teaching, I guess, because I would argue that actually what you're teaching is never really what you're teaching. Uh, what you think you're teaching is never what you're teaching. So if you think you're teaching Shakespeare or you think you're teaching biology, sure, you are teaching that content, that cognitive presence, but you are also teaching other things to your students. And much of that comes about through your teaching presence, right? So if you are teaching your students that to be curious is valuable um, through the ways that you value the questions that they ask and take them seriously, or you're teaching them that to be in university um, is, you know, to be valued as a, a member of a community by the way that you encourage them to connect with other people in their classrooms, those are things that you are teaching as well. And sometimes those are the things that learners take with them in the long run. That teaching presence is important. The other piece that Garrison Anderson and Archer um, foregrounded was social presence. And that is the presence of the other people in the class. And that is always really easy to see when you walk into that four walls of a classroom, right? You can see who's there. Once you get used to the classroom, you can see who's not there. You know who's gonna sit at the back. You know who's gonna talk all of those things and those people become essentially a mini or micro community for the duration of the course. But what Garrison Anderson and Archer were talking about back in 2001 was ways to build social presence or community of inquiry, even in online spaces. And one key of their presence model was they found that as long as two of those three circles were strong, in any given course that students usually reported a really positive educational experience. And so you can have a course that may not be your deep passion, right? I once took a statistics course. I can assure you that I was not intended by the creator to be a statistician, but I really enjoyed the teaching. I really enjoyed the people in the class. I had a really positive educational experience, even though when I sat down this summer 10 years later to do uh, survey work, I realized that I had retained maybe not as much as one possibly might wish to from that experience. Everything that the web enables is actually um, the things that we understand as humans about how to build connection and community. The web allows us to talk to each other to share work, to do all kinds of things that are part of the community building skills that most of us have as educators. Um, it just comes in different forms. And I love this meme because I was a big texter in the 80s. Uh, it was a real problem in school and I spent most of junior high in the hall as a result. But my 80s texts written up in little notes with my swirly handwriting and the little hearts on the eyes um, were, were artifacts that I was deeply proud of that built me community in that window. Oops. The thing about online courses, it's easy to prioritize that one circle of our content. And Sean Michael Morris from a paper a couple of years ago content does not equate to learning, right? Content is not the only thing. Obviously, we have to teach our content. That is our job. But it is very much never the whole experience. 
in a face-to-face -face classroom and it should not be the whole experience in an online classroom. This beautiful artifact um, from the ages is my third grade class. And when I look at it, I one of the people in the top row is still my BFF in the world. Most of the other people in the top row, I have no idea where they are now. But yeah, I grew up in PEI. Um, I lived there until two years ago. Uh, but I remember that teacher in the top corner. Um, and I remember mostly not what I mastered in third grade. I do remember that we read some poems and that I don't think I really grasped the multiplication, which is where the start of the whole statistics issue began. But I remember how she made me feel. Um, I remember the time that I hold my pen funny, my pencil funny, I guess at that age. Um, I've all, I'm right-handed, but I write with my wrist turned in. She was an elderly teacher, sort of uh, quite set in her ways. It drove her mad. And we had those little wooden desks that kind of wrapped around, but there were just like an old piece of wood st stuck on one piece of wood. And one day she got so frustrated with me um, for the way that I wrote that she slammed her hand down on my desk and said, Bonnie! And the desk literally clattered onto my knees. It broke right off. And I was quite afraid that I was literally going to lose bladder control because I was so absolutely mortified. That's what I remember about that classroom experience. She was not a nun. No, no, she, she might have missed that calling. I, I don't know. Um, but I remember the humanity of the kids I went to school with and how they made me feel. And I remember how that teacher made me feel. And that's what I retain years later. So that presence, right? That's what people keep with them. And to establish presence in a classroom, even if that classroom is online, there needs to be some opportunity for people to communicate their experiences and understandings. Now, sometimes our experiences, like this little Fisher-Price figure, are not great. Um, sometimes our experiences are all over the place, but we can use the web to find ways for people to connect um, with each other and share with each other the human experiences that they're having. However, that's not easy to do in an LMS. My old campus at UPEI used to use Moodle, and I think you just said that most of you do. Um, my current class, my current campus uses Blackboard, which frankly, honestly, I think is even worse. Um, the constrictions of the LMS and the ways in which the LMS is so teacher-centered work against the building of community for sure. However, this year, because of the pandemic, I've worked more in Blackboard than I ever have in a past course, simply because I didn't want to overload my students with too many platforms. Um, Kathy, I loved the, the, the Teams piece, and I'm seriously considering making a shift there. Um, I've been talking with folks at my university. We're, we're still getting up and running on Teams, and I, I really want to talk about how that went eventually. <laughs> uh, I want to hear from folks about how their Teams experiences have been, but there are definitely limitations in any box because the tools and platforms that we are given that are approved are, have baked in pedagogical assumptions and capacities, and sometimes they are not um, designed with community in mind. Okay, so KSC has Canvas. Fair. And that's the piece, right? That the, the teacher authority and the student in compliance are already baked in. And if you think about the idea of community, and frankly, I'm quite happy to live in my teacher authority, right? I will be very, very clear with my students. These are the places where these are boundaries and I need this from you. At the same time, I try really hard not to design all my teaching around the protection of that authority because that kind of one way, here's what you're going to do, is not actually the foundation of any decent community that I have ever been in um, or would necessarily want to be in. And that may just be my contrarian nature. But when somebody is solely interested in me as an object of compliance, I don't feel the urge to deeply connect with them. And I think the teacher presence piece, right? So what I wanna share 
kind of quickly today are, these are some of the things that I have done both in the past and currently to try to build my own teacher presence. And then I will talk a little bit about things that I've been trying to do to build student presence or social presence in my courses as well. Um, some of the key elements for me around teacher presence are actually to an extent about compliance, I guess, but in the sense of being clear and transparent with students about what I expect of them. Students generally get anxious, or at least there is a proportion of students in any class who will get anxious when they don't know what's expected of them. And if you have a student who's constantly at you wanting to know about the parameters of something, it took me a few years to realize that that student is experiencing anxiety. And that I, I may feel like, oh, yay, we're just going to build a community, but I need to be really clear to that student um, about what it means from my end, what my expectations are, so they are not always trying blindly to kind of feel their way to what is expected of them. So I try really hard to be super transparent and clear about these are the things that I need from you. Um, these are the times at which I need them. These are the circumstances in which absolutely please let me know and I can accommodate or adapt um, if you need me to, but this is it, right? And I try to lay that out for students. And my experience has been that the more clear I am about those things and honest, it, it has to be true transparency. I have to do some unpacking of what are my implicit expectations, right? And how am I giving students models and exemplars to show me the types of things that I'm asking for from them? Or am I expecting them to just magically know this stuff? Because sometimes we don't do a great job of um, being clear about how we want students to do the things that we're asking of them. And the more that we can show our own learning process or exemplars or that type of thing, I have found that the more that that also builds trust and connection because they, they have more of a sense of what the expectations are of them, which then is more of an invitation into an actual learning community. Invite feedback. I get anxious when I, I get anxious. They get anxious, I get anxious. When I invite feedback, I am always afraid that somebody is going to go, you suck. Every now and then I hear things that feel like you suck. But if I don't invite feedback, I can assure you that in the back channels in my program, the conversation about me sucking is still there, but I have no opportunity to address the thing that is at issue. I have lots to learn still about teaching and I give feedback. I try to give students um, formative, iterative feedback on the work that they do. I have 200 students, most terms. That is not easy. I have, I have the privilege because uh, I have graduate assistance um, of support in that, but I'm trying to learn different ways of giving feedback so not all of it is individual as well, but so that they feel seen um, in the work that they're doing. Yeah, and I just, Martha's mentioned, you know, um, feedback asks us to be vulnerable. I too believe that students need to be vulnerable to learn. And if we actually want to foster connection and community in our learning, then that is a risk that has to be taken. Um, so some of the very basic things that I do in terms of teacher presence, these ones are really more instrumental. These are not deep connection pieces, but I make sure our, our program is set up so that frankly, we could just start. Um, I taught a summer course this summer and uh, by in late July, when I was sending out this little visual on the left, um, all my students were like, oh my goodness, we haven't heard from any of our other profs. Um, but I try to send things out a whole week early uh, so that people have a chance to plan their month and their lives. I include that artifact that you see on the left, which is just a visual syllabus. I have a 15 page syllabus full of all of those details of our course, all of the things the students need to know, but who can look through that all the time? 
I probably couldn't. So what I've been trying to do is create these little instant at a glass, at a glance, this is when we meet, these are what your assignments are elements that pair down that sense and that cognitive load of what they have to keep in their minds and carry. I hate making videos. Um, I don't mind doing live talks at all. I don't actually even mind seeing myself on recordings, but when I sit down to try to do a short video, you might as well be asking me to fly. Um, I have been known to make 37 takes for a two minute video. I am still trying to include more video content in what I'm doing, particularly in fully online courses, because I want that chance to build some sense of, hi, it's me, this is who I am, here we go together, because I think that that's important. I would not follow a faceless person. Um, and I try to emphasize formats and times to reach me. But the big thing that I tell students that is much less sort of the instrumental pieces, if you don't know what to do, here's how you can get in touch with me, right? And if we're already in a live class, I'm not gonna see my email or my messages, so please message somebody else in the class. The big piece on the right, don't panic. My students have now, in almost every course that I've watched, that I've taught, watched me have some kind of tech failure. I'm their tech teacher, right? And so I tell them right at the beginning, you are gonna watch me mess this up. This is gonna be a great learning opportunity because you are gonna be teachers and maybe you will be teaching online and maybe the tech will fail you. And so this is how I handle it. And I'm gonna to try to model for you that actually we are not uh, you know, heart surgeons. And if the tech fails, no one dies hopefully and that is great and so we will log back in and we will keep going and we will save our work but we will keep trying and that actually that piece has been really important in all the courses that I've taught because I think that students often end up feeling and I think faculty often end up feeling like the tech is this really um, unmovable object that is possibly out to get us and um, that if it doesn't work somehow we have done something wrong because teachers are supposed to be the knowers right and when we don't know the tech and like I said every time I use a new zoom system I encounter new challenges but it's important sometimes particularly with students to be like this is what it looks like to work through this so that's part of my teacher presence also my presence is really a site of pedagogy for me because I am always trying to learn and change and sometimes that is awkward. Um, the big piece around the communications element of pedagogy is that a lot of teaching ends up being very similar to what I'm doing now, right? I do hopefully often have knowledge to impart to my students um, and so it's kind of like the old school TV set where when I was a kid and I would get up, we had two channels and that was it. And you watched what was on and it was broadcast media. And we often teach by broadcasting and that's okay. But there's also this whole rich world of many to many communications. And even in face-to-face -face classes, we don't tend to do a great job of many to many communications because what happens in a face-to-face -face class if everybody starts talking at once? Right? For real, what happens? It's complete chaos. And God forbid, if one of your colleagues was walking down the hall and saw your class with everybody talking, maybe they would judge you. My, my Bachelor of Ed students are very afraid of appearing not to, you know, have chaos. Um, it is one of the great gifts of the web that actually many to many communications works better on the web because it's not loud. Um, because people can talk to multiple people. I actually don't mind personal chaos in that sense in classes either, but my students are terrified of it. Um, whereas when we use platforms that allow threaded communications, suddenly the communications of one student can be seen in real time by multiple other students. We don't need to be all face-to-face -to -face together. And so a big part of my building community in online classes and building my teacher presence is actually pulling back 
from that broadcast and trying to find ways to foster the many to many or something that looks a little more like the right hand side of the screen here rather than centralized instruction where students can establish themselves and make themselves visible to each other in these networked conversations. Now, students don't always want to be visible to each other. They don't always know that it's safe to get there. And so that's a big part of my job and my teacher presence as well is finding ways to be welcoming and fostering while not necessarily being demanding that they engage in those networked type conversations. The big thing that is different about the web, right, is that we are accustomed to working in institutions and we all have a role, we have a job to do. And literally, if suddenly on Monday, we weren't there anymore, somebody else would be slotted into that role and things would broadly speaking, carry on. In a network, like that vision from the last slide of many to many communications, individuals have identities and it's their job to be themselves, right? And you can't make a networked conversation where everyone is just giving mastery answers. That is not going to really work because if there are right answers, then nobody can build on the last thing someone said and necessarily add their own take to it. It's just good, we're one, we're done. So this is where the student presence or social presence element of the presence model comes in. I get my students sometimes to share anonymously using live slides. And I call live slides those blank slides where I might put up a question, put up right on me, and then, and I would have loved to have modeled up today, but again, I got scared. Um, uh, but the, the idea that they can anonymously contribute, and I build that gradually, right? Start right at the beginning, build that gradually into every course that I teach so that they get used to contributing and seeing each other's contributions. I also throw them into breakout groups, give them a variety of tasks to do together. Um, I get them responding to each other's discussion board posts. Discussion boards can be very structured and limited. At the same time, I try to make sure that my discussion board posts ask somewhat open-ended questions. And again, it's easier because the content that I teach is relatively open-ended, but my students are going to be teachers. So I also get them to give each other feedback. They choose two people to give feedback to. It is quite structured, but we use something called the RISE model and it's uh, reflect, inquire, suggest, and elevate. So it's always a four sentence response because the worst thing ever about discussion forum posts in my mind is when people get into that formulaic piece of here is my answer, that was a nice comment, thank you Robin for sharing, have a nice day, or I think there's a classic meme that went around on the internet where one student is like, I like bread, and then another student is like, I like bread too, thank you for sharing that you like bread. And um, that's, yep. You, um, I'm trying to get it for the captions and I see it in the chat too. What, can you say it again, what right? Oh. Story, yeah. Rise is reflect, inquire, suggest, and elevate. And if you Google that, it's a model from about 2011. I found it on the internet about five years ago. I've been using it in all my courses. It's really valuable for education students because they need to learn to give formative feedback to each other, right? That's a core piece of what they do. I get students using tools like Hypothesis. Also, I try to get beyond the discussion forums. Um, I don't know if any of you have used Hypothesis for shared annotation. Hypothesis is currently my favorite ed tech company. In fact, possibly the only ed tech company that I actually um, feel ethically good about using. Um, and I, because I'm an education teacher, I get my students presenting or teaching new ideas to the class. These pieces all build social presence because students become aware of who is in their class, even if they never see them. They see each other's avatars, they, like their little pictures. They see each other's names. They sometimes hear each other's voices when people grab the mic and communicate. They gradually, over the course of a term, become aware that they are in a learning group, at least with other people. And if we build enough opportunity for them to share in meaningful ways, some semblance of a community. And every time that they contribute, they are building their own visibility in that community. 
There are a variety of ways to contribute. So it doesn't have to be that they take the mic. I, do, I love Mentimeter. And yes, uh, what I love about Mentimeter, Irene, is that they can see each other's responses as well. So it allows for that sense of, am I kind of in line with the group? Um, what are the variations in this group? Which gives them a sense of the room that they are addressing when they communicate. And that piece is important, but it's the places where they can see who is contributing, the non-anonymous places that then build that kind of network sense of who each other are. So I think both are very important. Also possible, I've done things that are in, particularly in past courses, but Twitter chats, syllabus scavenger hunts, right? Where I get them to go in in groups and find things in the syllabus because otherwise they may not read it. Um, little third place kind of spaces, water cooler spaces, flip grid for video discussions rather than just constantly writing things. I love student built assignments where they will do like you know, a, a video case study designed by group one, solved by group two or events. But this fall, I had to cut almost all of these things except for the top two from my courses, even though other years we have totally been able to fit them in because it is harder when everybody is fully online to fit all those things in. And that's key to recognize that community is hard to build when people are overloaded, right? How many of you, honest, this year have had less sort of extra space, extra headspace just for kind of connecting or whatever? I certainly have. Um, I am not, not only can I not see my friends in most cases here in Ontario, but I'm also just like I've worn out on the idea of having Zoom calls to socialize. Um, I'm sort of shut down and I think my students are as well. And so recognizing that and not overloading is valuable. Here, uh, Dave and I back in the spring developed our own framework um, and I love the ACE framework. I love anything that's conceptual and simple and has a rule of three that let people kind of go forward. Ours was the C framework or simple, equitable, engaging. When we're teaching online, try to keep things as simple as possible as equitable as possible and engaging where possible. And this was a resource that I developed for my own faculty as a guideline for teaching online from those principles, um, hoping that that would be kind of something that would hold us together through the fall term. But reality, I remember back in the spring when people were talking about sort of the whole working from home thing and whatever. And I saw, uh, again, a meme or a tweet go by and it said, you know, we're, we're not working from home. We're, we're living at work, right? And there's something very different about that. And the, the cognitive load and all of it is just much less controlled than traditional working from home. I've worked from home a great deal of my career. This year is not working from home. And for my students, it's very much not working from home. And that was really driven home when in one of those presentations that my students was do, were doing um, this fall, the leader of the class group, who was clearly the person who had kind of taken a fair amount of ownership of the presentation that they were doing, um, was speaking and going through a slide deck, but there was this terrible background noise and I thought someone else's mic was on or something like that. So I actually interrupted and I said, I'm sorry, David, I'm gonna interrupt you. Um, is there something going on with noise? Does anybody have mics? Because I'm having trouble catching. And a number of other students in the chat were like, yeah, I can't hear. And David turned his camera on. This picture is shared with his permission. He lives in a studio apartment. Uh, two days before, his upstairs neighbor had let their bathtub overflow, um, which had completely soaked and destroyed all of his kitchen cupboards. Our class was at 9.30 that morning, and at 8.30 that morning, his landlord said, hey, I'm sending someone over to destroy your kitchen. There we are. Um, so this was literally the circumstance in which he was having to present a graded assignment. Now, I didn't know in advance, I'm not a total monster, um, but I was like, oh my goodness, how, like, what can we do, right? Like, how, how can I support this student? How do I build trust and presence 
um, when a student is literally having to go through a graded assignment in this particular circumstance. It was pretty, it made me take a step back and be like, I've been asking a lot. And that's where we get into the concept of equity. Um, I try hard to design for equity, for equity of where do students live and what am I asking of them? Um, are students parenting and what am I asking of them in times when their kids may be literally in their house when we're in school? How do my students learn and what am I asking of them? What kinds of identity burdens are they carrying in this year um, of, you know, finally sort of big conversations around Black Lives Matter, but what kind of grief and mourning are they carrying in that time? And what am I asking of them? And how much am I treating our course like a race that some of them are not nearly as equitably equipped to run? And I haven't reached, uh, ooh, I have an answer on this. Um, I don't think that I have managed to level the playing of field of my course, but one of the biggest things that I'm doing is trying to stop seeing it as a race where everybody needs to get to the same place, and that's hard. Tech also, while it can be really great for building some of the things that we need to do with students to create community, um, also is not always equitable not always safe um, and it, it every platform that we use is collecting data on our students and in the case at least of my institution efforts to try to make that transparent and have communications and have perhaps an ethics system around student data similar to the research ethics system that we have across our entire sector um, we call it by different names in our two countries but we don't do research without considering um, all of the ethical elements of that, but we engage in student data collection every single moment that they are in our classrooms this year when we're online. And we don't always know where that data goes, who is using it, what it can be used for, and data is extremely valuable to tech companies right now. And I think that that piece is just important to at least park um, that's my current actual area of research, but uh, it's, it's an important foundation to this community conversation because I think you can build genuine community even in a surveilled environment, um, but at the same time, you've got to recognize that that surveillance is, al is always there. Tech has biases. We also as faculty, and I mean the general we here, so if it's not you, that's okay, but we have our own biases um, around the way that we teach, around what we know, and sometimes my own faculty colleagues and myself um, have some of the stubbornness around you will take my teaching from my cold dead hands that is a little bit similar to what I see in this billboard. And that is where I used universal design for learning as a way to try to get underneath some of my own biases as an educator and allow for meaningful connection from where my students are. So universal design for, I started teaching myself universal design for learning about five years ago. I think one of your other presenters talked about that this week. They probably have a far more informed and um, educated perspective on universal design for learning. I am a self-taught hack. Um, I was teaching an adult ed course and I had to teach universal design for learning as a content piece and I didn't even know what it was and then I started learning about it and I was like, I guess I shouldn't teach this without trying to put it in action. And so for me at the core of universal design for learning is the idea of multiple means. It breaks learning into three sort of concepts engagement, representation, and action and expression. And in the simplest sense, I think of multiple means as represent, of representation as different ways that I get students to engage with what they're learning, like giving them things to read, but also things to watch. Multiple means of engagement as ways to have them work 
This is often where the community piece comes in, work with those ideas until they have learned them, like go through that active learning process and action and expression, multiple means of showing their learning. So then I'm not just getting them to, again, in the stuff I teach, I don't do tests, but tests can be relevant, but I'm not just testing or I'm not just getting them to write essays. I'm getting them to use different forms and have choice in their forms of how they show their learning. The thing I like about UDL is that it assumes that any class of students will have this wide variety of difference in all kinds of axes and fronts. And it tries to make at least an effort towards including and giving options to students no matter where they are coming from on what axes. So for me, these are just some examples of things that I do that are kind of in the UDL vein. Um, in my work that I also think helps build the kind of trust and presence that are necessary for community. Always using visuals to um, when I kind of have a lesson. So this is a clip from one of my Blackboard lessons. I write these little pieces up weekly. This was our topic for the week. Um, it was actually equity, but I try not to put a whole wall of text in Blackboard. I'm including relevant visuals or videos. And then if you can look at the bottom, key ideas so that students can see this is what I need to take away from this lesson. Just kind of chunking those things up and making it so that people can look at it and get a gist of the main idea, really important. Also in relation to readings, <clears throat> stepping beyond the usual suspects, maybe not just teaching Foucault um, <laughs> in the stuff that I do, including uh, the voices of uh, women scholars, women of color, folks who are not speaking English as a first language, breaking down some of those ideas around who is, um, who is a knower in our society through what my students are learning so that my students who look more like these, these women than they do like Michel Foucault um, can feel like maybe they too have a place in that because you can't build community if people don't feel like they actually have a place. I mentioned earlier that I hate making videos. So I make really silly short videos giving my students group feedback. This was made on a Friday night. That expression is me going, hi students, it's Friday night. I'm sure you're delighted to hear from me, um, but I'm seeing your assignments come up and there's one thing I need you to know, we need to go in this direction, right? So if I see five or six assignments get posted and I'm thinking I was not clear enough in communicating what I wanted from those students, hey, throw out a really quick watchable video that just says, this is what I'd like, this is the direction I'd like you to go in. If you've already done it, you don't need to redo it, but this is the direction that I'd like you to go in because I want our conversation to move here. And I'm transparent about those things that I want so that um, hopefully uh, they can feel like then when they get any kind of feedback from me, like it's not that weird feedback that clearly had somebody else's entire kind of work. I'm thinking of like academic reviewer two feedback, you know, when that person reads your paper and it's clear that they really just wanted to read their own paper. Um, I think we as faculty do that to our students sometimes and it's important to try to avoid that particular instantiation of authority. Oh yeah, great face for radio, love that. Um, I try, this is the big piece, I try to offer alternative means of showing learning. Universal design for learning um, in multiple means of action and expression in the work that I do has come to mean asking my students to make artifacts responding to papers that we read or whatever. They can make blog posts, they can make infographics, they can make sketch notes like the one that you see on the left, which is about universal design for learning. Um, one of my students made a literal material sketch note, which you see pictured with her permission on the right. There are a whole bunch of really interesting ideas about this hybrid pedagogy article there. And it's completely done in little, um, she actually, this was last year, so she brought it to my office and I got to touch it and see it, but it was an amazing artifact. Um, she got to choose the model. I get students doing Flipgrid assignments, that type of thing, so they can see each other. I 
this is big with any UDL, I have to reframe my rubrics. I have to be willing to accept that different forms of expression, some will be more visual, some will um, have different depth to them and try to be fair about any grading that's involved um, so that I'm not penalizing students for taking a risk and trying a new format, right? This is just uh, one of my students in an adult ed course a couple of years ago when I first started doing UDL was a police training instructor, not my area at all, but he did a whole presentation for the class on gang signs. Interesting. It was, it needed to be a visual piece in order to make sense. If I had had him do that as a, an essay, it would not have been nearly as impactful as it was. But all of this has meant that I have to build my literacies in seeing the work that students are doing and not necessarily um, judging them for trying something for the first time. So the first time anybody makes a video or an infographic or whatever, it's not going to be amazing, but I do try to make my rubrics clear that they need to like focus on visuals, focus on fonts, whatever. These are some of, they do Twitter essays, all kinds of things. Um, and some of you may not use rubrics. I, I don't, I didn't used to, but education as a field is so deeply tied to rubrics and my students are expected to use rubrics with their students. So I'm trying to build, again, in, in as transparent a way as I can and model what rubrics can look like and how they can be more open. And where I can, I try to make evaluation more formative and peer-based because I secretly believe that all of us as teachers have a small Lisa Simpson inside of us worried about not doing it right. And most of my students do as well. And the more that I can give them experience in giving each other evaluation, I'm training them to, to be better teachers, I hope. But the focus for me of UDL and the reason that I value it is that it's about choice. I love this picture. I love books. I'm very much, I'm Gen X. I'm from the, the print sort of, I'm, I'm deeply print in my bones, no matter how much I've worked online. But I think sometimes when we focus all of our learning around print, even in online spaces, then we do create a staircase that essentially takes a lot of students nowhere, um, just into a wall of print that may not be for them. And I love this. Sometimes we don't get what we're expecting. If we put something out for students that clearly has a suggested right answer, we may not get the right answer that we are expecting. Sorry for the um, potty word, but obviously that teacher was expecting the word this. The other word actually fits. Um, <laughs> and if we penalize students when we haven't seen the gaps in what were put, hits exactly. When, when we penalize students for not, uh, for seeing the gaps that we haven't seen, all we are teaching is compliance and not community. And so I think it's really important that we think about the ways that the web can be a gate to opening connections rather than a barrier for closing them. And for whom? Because for some of our students, the more that we can do UDL and utilize digital tools, to enrich our classes, even when we're back face to face, I think that we probably do more on that equity front for many students. Um, I love this quote from Papert, nothing could be more absurd than a classroom in which computers are placed and nothing else has changed. And it's really important when we're online that we consider the pedagogical changes, the presence, focus on that or we will not have community. But presence in community can emerge when we find authentic ways to let people connect with each other using what the web offers us. It won't be the same, um, but it can be real and it can be valid. Thank you. And this is my favorite closing slide. Um, I am stopping the live captioning for just a minute um, as we chit chat here. And uh, let me get things going here. All right, so we are right on time and I wanna thank Bonnie. And before she leaves, I think we have time for a couple of questions. 
Um, and I have not been watching the chat since I have been captioning. And unfortunately, I don't think I can pass the captioning off. Um, so I'll, I'll pick that up in a second. Martha, you can see if you could get in there, but I kind of think maybe you can't. Um, but anyway, does anybody want to start with a question? You can either raise your hand. We've got about 40 people, so it might be a good idea to um, raise your hand with the raise hand function or just wave at me if you want to ask something. Otherwise, I have one thing that I did see in the chat, but um, go ahead, Matthew Cini. Hi, Bonnie. Um, one of the things I struggled most with with community this term was being simultaneously synchronous and asynchronous with the same class. Um, the synchronous stuff didn't really matter so much whether we were online or in the room because in the room we were masked and socially distant and it we, would have been easier if we were just all online. Um, but the asynchronous was really hard because either it felt like it was going to create its own separate community or it was feeling less than the community within the classroom or on Zoom. And I wondered if you have any thoughts or experience with that. I want to understand the context that you're referring to, first of all, like when, how, how was your course structured? Um, it was, it was everything <laughs> possible. Um, so students were able to choose freely day by day, whether to be in the classroom, whether to be on Zoom or whether to do the work asynchronously. So were you having to broadcast your live classes? Yes, we, we were in a Zoom enabled classroom. My hat goes off to you. Um, I have to say that's not an experience that I have actually had. Our institution, we did not have any face-to-face -face pretty much broadly speaking in Canada. At my institution, only like theater classes were face-to-face were -face, and even those I think have been um, cut down at this point. Um, my sense of, when I first heard that folks were being asked to do that, I was staggered um, because I think that the way in which um, good online pedagogy is designed requires a focus on the online and the affordances of those tools and the ways in which good face-to-face -face is designed requires a focus on the affordances that being together in space create and so I, I I'm sorry like I all I have is like god I think you made it um my honest belief is that I don't think people should be doing that and I know that it's very popular um but truthfully each modality has its particular strengths, right? And there are things that the web can't do that you can do face-to-face. Many-to-many many communications is better in an online space than it actually is face-to-face, -face. but online tends to be the privileged mode. Or, sorry, face-to-face -face tends to be the privileged mode in the sense that we've all been acculturated since we were five to sit in those classrooms. And so once you have people sitting in the classrooms, the people who are there online, um, they're going to just feel like they're getting a, a thinner, I guess, version of that experience, a, a one-way experience of that. And if you were to take um, and focus on the networking and, and that, that the online modality offers, the people in the class probably would feel possibly even upset because our implicit expectations when we're sitting in a space is you're gonna, gonna talk to me, right? The people who are out there are, are not at the center. So yeah, I, I, I really um, look forward to hearing more actually from folks who were doing that type of mixed mode experience um, as the sort of post pandemic um, thinking continues. But yeah, I, I would think that someone just mentioned my writing students asked for single mode experiences. I'm, I'm truly uh, impressed that you managed it, but I do not honestly believe that it is pedagogically a good choice. Um, and I'm sure it was not necessarily your choice. <laughs> um, what we had to do. My message to institutions would be we cannot be all things to all people. And in many cases, we're forced to be less in both modalities if we're trying to do both at once. Now, some of you may have done an amazing job of it. And my, again, my hat goes off, but it, it is not really possible to do all things at once. Um, were all of you teaching in that context? 
No, it was, uh, we luckily had a lot of choice in how we deliver things. For my courses and our students, it seemed to me the only choice to be able to meet their needs at right. this time, in, the, in these circumstances. Right. Well, and I mean, I, I, I hugely respect the effort to try to accommodate students. And I think that the opportunity to stay home is really important um, in this context. But the pedagogically, the two just simply, they're not the same. They don't go together. Um, and I, I wish I had a great answer for it, but I don't. I'm just gonna jump in and, and do two things. Um, the first is to say, um, I, I think the collab has really decided like professionally as an organization that we are not really supporting high flex teaching anymore, but instead thinking more along the lines of Martha's development of hybrid flexible um, so that you can teach sometimes in face-to-face -face modalities, sometimes in synchronous online, and sometimes in asynchronous online, because we really have come to prove Bonnie's point um, that they are, that the design for the different modalities is very different. And when people try to smush those all together, um, very few people felt like they were able to have success. So that doesn't mean you have to ditch what's classically called high flex um, in, in the sense of these moving back and forth modalities, like Bonnie's fully online with her institution. We're not gonna do that at Plymouth for now, um, but to maybe look back at some of these different models for reducing the number of times you've got the Zoom camera in the corner of the room and two live students and seven online students. Um, so I think your presentation today, Bonnie, really reminded us, um, if I take one thing away, it's really that many to many affordance that we can do a lot of really interesting community building with the web if we think about how online spaces are shaped. Um, so that was fantastic. And I am going to invite Bonnie to throw into the chat your Twitter handle because people may want to um, uh, follow up with you at various points, but I also want to remind folks that Bonnie is just constantly posting lots of content, both from herself and from others who do this kind of work. Um, so it's also helpful as the semester's unfolding to just keep following people who are having these conversations. Um, so thank you, Bonnie. Cheers and reaction applause to you. My pleasure. Uh, and I'm sorry that I, I ran a little long on Zoom. I can't see what time it is. Um, I just want to say one more thing about the whole high flex thing, because I, I, I'm still processing that there are folks, this may be a failure of my imagination, right, to because I haven't done it. There are folks who um, I know have done it more successfully than I have thought about it. And I think you are now some of those folks who may want to build out conversation about this. And also that many to many piece, if we were to frame for students who may be there in person, we're going to still focus on focus on networked communication and using devices to connect with the people who are outside of this physical classroom. That might be a possibility that might be relevant for some classes. Um, really impressed with all the things that you are doing there. I loved the conversation in the chat. Thanks for having me. Have a wonderful day and take care. Thanks, Bonnie. Bye, Bonnie. Bye, folks. Um, and just a reminder that, um, first of all, I'm going to stop the recording, but hang out for a sec if you want.